Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for the European Citizen Science Association webinar, Learning from Mistakes, Failures in Citizen Science. I'd like to introduce Marika Zielinski of, of the Center for Citizen Science in Vienna, who will be leading this webinar today. Um, in just a moment, I will hand off control of the session to Marika, and then she and the other speakers can do a short round of introductions before continuing on. Enjoy. Well, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Marek Zielinski. I'm from the Center for Citizen Science in uh, Vienna from the ÖAD. And let me just share my slides with you before we dive right into the topic. So as Paul said, the, the topic of today is learning from mistakes, failures, and citizen science. And I'm not here by myself, but I'm here with my colleagues with whom uh, together we wrote a paper named Recognizing Failures in Citizen Science Projects, Lessons Learned. And this paper is basically based on results um, that we collected during a webinar, no, during a workshop that we conducted um, at the Austrian Citizen Science Conference in 2020. And um, it was a very, well, very productive uh, workshop. And we decided to write an article in the proceedings of uh, of the conference, and that's what we're also going to talk about today. So as I said, I'm here with my colleagues, um, and while preparing this slide in order to present to you all of us in a nice way, um, well, that's what happened. Uh, Florian Westreicher fell on the site uh, from the University of Innsbruck. Barbara Heinisch uh, from the University of Vienna became anonymous. Um, thank God Marlene Ernst stayed in a nice way. She is actually working at the moment at the University of Passau. But then um, in the second row, uh, well, row, you see Thomas Hübner from the ZAM, Johannes Rüdiser from the University of Innsbruck, and myself on the right side. I managed to cut off uh, like a third of our heads. Um, and then somehow the Dona Frigerio from the University of Vienna turned out uh, very nice. Um, so you can see every everything of uh, Didona. She's here with us today. Um, she will not be presenting, but she was involved in the paper and also in preparing this webinar with us. So um, yeah, so what did I learn from basically this fail that happened uh, when preparing this slide? don't use smart art in PowerPoint. That is my first lesson learned of the day for you. <laughs> yes. So um, now that you know a little bit about us or you have seen part at least of our faces, we would like to get to know you. And um, we prepared a Padlet, a little, let's say, survey for you. So we would like to know where are you from and what is your scientific background? And Florian will post the link to this Padlet in the chat. But before you just um, run off to the Padlet, uh, please bear with me for one more moment. I will tell you what we would like you to do, actually. So the question is clear. Maybe some of you um, have not used Padlet yet. So when you get um, on the, on the, onto the Padlet um, slide, please press on the right side uh, in the right corner on the plus. There you can actually put your location and you can also color your post in a certain color. And we would ask you to color it in the color of your discipline. So arts would be red. If you come from humanities, please color it orange. If you're from engineering and technology, then please choose purple. For natural sciences, we have green. For social and economic sciences, we have blue. And if you cannot find yourself in any of these disciplines, please choose white. So yeah, so you have the possibility. You can either click on the link in the chat or just scan the QR code with uh, your smartphone. 
And if you have done that, then just please choose your location, choose your color and post it. That would be amazing. Then we see who is here today and we get a bit of a better impression of the participants today. I think by now, most of you probably already scanned or opened the link. So Malene, please show us who is here today with us. Okay, we see there are already many inputs coming in. Malene will also show us for the ones who have no idea how to do this, uh, that you just need to press on the plus, put in your, um, your city, and then at the end of this post, you can choose the color according to your discipline, just as she did right now. Of course, she had it displayed in German because we're all from Austria today. Um, but yeah, you can see there is a lot of uh, actually white, um, well, the white that was other turns out to be pink on the map, but there are also some natural sciences here. I see a few reds, which is arts, and also quite some uh, people from social and economic sciences. Oh, and there is one purple, which is engineering and technology. Very interesting. A lot of people coming, well, from Austria, <laughs> some from, from Germany, I see. Uh, there's There are two people from England or from the UK, also two from Norway. Great. Um, just so you know, so all the, so we will do today two more questions and uh, get you a little bit active today because it's an interactive webinar. Um, and all the results, all the padlets and mentimeters that we will be using today, they will stay online uh, until the end of the week. So you can always come back if you don't manage to put all the inputs that you wanted to put. There will be always um, yeah, a possibility to do it or check later on until the end of the week. So thank you very much for your participation. I think we got quite a good impression on, on who is here today. And let us switch back to our presentation. So what can you expect from this webinar? I will give you a quick overview. So I will start by giving you a short introduction on the topic. Then uh, Malene and, uh, no, sorry, then Florian and Barbara will tell you about what kind of fails happened to researchers in citizen science projects in different project phases. Next, of course, the question arises like, okay, fails happen, but what can you do about them? What can you do to omit them? So Malena and Thomas will be presenting some anti-fail tips and speak about their experience. And last but not least, um, we will go into a short discussion and see what questions you have, if you have any um, comments that you would like to make. And this will be the end of the webinar. So why are we actually doing this webinar on fails? Um, the reason is that we would like to share experiences and lessons learned that we made or the, our colleagues um, made regarding fails in citizen science projects. So of course, we would like to hear from you um, during also those small surveys, how your experiences are uh, on this topic. And we're also doing this because we would like to understand um, how you are dealing with fails. And also we would like to contribute to establishing some kind of error culture in the citizen science community. And why do we actually want to talk about fails or why should we talk about fails? Well, the reason is very simple because fails, although they're very useful to for us um, and it's very useful to know about them, 
we don't really like to talk about them. We don't want to speak about what went wrong. We don't like to speak about uh, things that didn't work out. We prefer to talk to our colleagues and everyone about all the great things that we did, all the great things that were successful. So fails are basically a taboo. And it's, um, well, rather strange because actually fails are an, are an imminent part of academic processes that do drive research progress. So what, we, what can we do about it? We need to change the perspective of how we look at fails. We need to um, have a more positive framing of, on fails. And what we can do is we can redefine fails into lessons learned. That would be probably a more positive outlook at fails. So it would be important to start and building awareness on a topic and really start to be more open-minded on fails and um, start to establish this error culture. And how can we do this? Well, uh, first and foremost, we would say, share your fails proudly. Another idea that we gathered is that maybe um, we could publish a special journal issue on fails. Well, maybe not ourselves, but just there could be a special journal issue on the topic of fails to really uh, put it out uh, in the public, to really have something focused where people can um, share uh, their uh, fails and, and um, well, unsuccessful trials at, at things they did in citizen science projects. And another thing that came to our minds was that we could organize fail events. And that's why we're also doing this webinar because we really want to put out, um, yeah, this topic and, and raise awareness and, and see what comes back and how the community is reacting to it. So there are, of course, many other ideas that um, you might have. Maybe you can post them in the chat if you'd like. And we can start talking about possibilities to how establish an air culture in the citizen science community. So that was uh, a little introduction. Now we would like to know from you how you actually deal with fails. And we prepared a Mentimeter. Probably many of you already worked with Mentimeter. Florian will share the link to the Mentimeter in the chat, but you can also access it via the website. So www.menti.com. There you can put the code 86890210. Or again, you can scan the QR code and access it through your, your smartphone. And once you're inside Mentimeter, you will see that we prepared six answers. It's a multiple choice. Um, and the answers are, I keep fails to myself. Only my team and I know about them. I tell other colleagues about them. I tell my superiors, institutional management about them. I communicate them to the funding body and I communicate them in publications. So I think by now everybody already accessed the Mentimeter and I would ask Malena to share the screen to see what has happened there. So the answers are coming in. And we can see that many people um, tell other colleagues about their fails. There are even around 10% of people who communicate fails to the funding body and uh, also communicate them in publications. That's very interesting um, because of course, then you also put yourself very much out there. And there are some that keep them to themselves and a few that also well twice as much that also tell their team about them 
So thank you very much for the inputs. As I said, if you didn't, if you don't manage uh, to put your input now, or you want to look at it later, um, you can always do this after the webinar. Everything will stay online until the end of the week. Yes, so thank you very much for your participation. I will share again my presentation so we can actually go to the next part and I just need to manage to do that one second okay let me just make this big So now um, we have my colleagues Florian and Barbara who will tell you about what kind of fails we collected during our workshop and which kind of fails researchers experienced in their citizen science projects. So please, Florian, the floor is yours. Um, Marika, thanks for the introduction. I'm Florian Westrecher from the University of Innsbruck <clears throat> in uh, Western Austria. And we are now, um, Marika, please uh, start with the first slide. Thank you. Uh, we, we kind of reclassified in our workshop um, different project phases. And Barbara and I <clears throat> will now briefly tell you about different failures from citizen science projects based on these phases. And the first phase um, is always the um, project phase of gathering the idea and the research design. And um, here a very kind fail happened, which can be summarized as a different ideas, motivations and goals. And um, that comes up when you have different project partners on board. It can happen that uh, people come together who have, have different goals and motivations running a project. For example, this can happen if it's for you important to do really adventurous um, data collection in the field because you're a big fan of, um, let's say, Indiana Jones or you're addicted to fieldwork or whatever. And then other, then other uh, project partner wants to work mainly <clears throat> on his own scientific career and focuses on um, massive, uh, on high rising um, publications with a massive impact factor. And the third partner, for example, um, the main focus for them is public engagement and um, the method and the scientific output itself is a sec of secondary matter. In this case um, of these two uh, different goals and motivations, even the best um, project idea may hit the brakes at the right at the start. Um, so that's kind of like at the very beginning. Marika, may I ask you for the next slide, please? Yeah, well, <clears throat> and the, um, after the project idea, there's uh, the best you can do is uh, project planning. So the next phase after the project idea, um, there, there are several things that can go wrong. And here we often had to deal with failures depending on several factors. So these parts are usually strongly dependent on each other and often occur in different groups. And one point um, in this project planning phase is time management. In citizen science projects or in science projects, you often have to deal with different stakeholders, some of whom have very different uh, annual schedules, um, or let's say they are more or less unsynchronized with their biorhythms. So if, for example, universities cooperate with schools in science pro uh, citizen science projects, um, please look very closely to their closing times or and the, when they are on vacation. Um, so if you plan a big data collection campaign exactly in this holiday time, um, and you expect many students and pupils and teachers um, it can be happen that you're um, rather alone in the forest or wherever you want to collect your data. <clears throat> so that's what happened. Um, what also can be a problem uh, within the time management is um, 
attracting participants um, if you set the wrong times or choose the wrong channels for your project communication or project announcement you maybe will end up with just two participants instead of the 200 you had hoped for and that can be um uh, that could can put a lot of pressure on your well planned project and <clears throat> when recruiting participants is done too late and or you already started with tools which are not working well um this is another rather stressful um issue for your um, project and that can induce a big extra effort in communication which you did not plan at all and then the third part um in the project planning phase um is the participant uh, the participants itself so let's look at the citizen scientists themselves it of often happens that they have enormously high expectations and they are fully motivated um, when they start off with uh, the citizen science project and they want to make new data available for science or for the community and um, so that's if you think you're, about your own work that can be um, the same thing with you. So, of course, they expect their participation to have a big impact on decision makers. Sometimes they uh, expect that their data is, uh, has to be published quickly, and sometimes they expect um, really fast responses from um, people who are involved in their project. So you have a lot of communication, um, which you probably did not plan in the very beginning and that can go wrong rather rather well and the fourth point um, is also the personal one um, when the staff of project partners changes like uh, school teachers leave the schools or a lab staff um, leaves university um, chaos maybe um, will be at your side yeah <laughs> um, unless there is a a well done project documentation so that's those are the um the failures which occurred in the project planning and now i'm handing over to barbara heinisch from the university of vienna and ask marke for the next slide so what can you actually do to make your citizen science project fail in the data collection phase so the first thing you should do is to ensure that your hardware or software or app or whatever you are providing is not working reliably. One case might be that you did not test the software, that you use the software you have just developed and now the citizens test it and they will test it thoroughly. So you might find they might find any issue in the software. If you want to make your citizen science project fail in the data collection phase, you might also uh, make digital citizen science tools too exclusive which means that only certain people, certain groups of people can actually use them. For example, if they are too complicated, if they require different software that needs to be installed first and so on. And in the data collection phase, also over-motivated participants can be a problem. Why? For example, if they go out into the field and collect data, for example, of different plant species, but they don't care about borders, about fences, about anything, then they might risk of being injured and might have some safety issues here as well. Regarding data collection, if you want to have your project fail, you might also include failure in communication design, which means you do not communicate what the participants actually have to do, when they have to do it, and so on. And you might also inaccurately address your participants. Another failure might be that participant acquisition tools is difficult to use, which means which relates to this hardware or software not working reliably. So especially technology might fail in this data collection phase as well. Another issue might be that there are too many steps in data collection, which means you ask too much from the participants. They should do this, they should consider that, they should uh, collect this data, separate it, and so on and so on. And another might 
issue might be that there are digital hurdles for citizen scientists, which means some participants might not have a good internet connection. Some participants might not have enough digital literacy to actually participate in your project. So you have to really consider your citizen scientists that you want to address and adjust your methods accordingly. And please, the next slide regarding the data analysis phase. How can you succeed in failing your citizen science project in this phase? First of all, you have a data set that's too inhomogeneous, which means that also relates to the data collection phase. You might not have a good description, good tutorials or instructions. And so you have a data set that you might not be able to use at all. On the other hand, you might also end up with a lot of post-processing of the data. For example, since you did not explain thoroughly in the data collection phase what they actually have to do and what are the criteria they have to meet, then there might be a lot of post-processing necessary. And finally, how to fill your project in the data analysis phase. There might be too many categories that citizens might use in the analysis phase. For example, we had an app where we asked the citizens to collect data about linguistic texts in the public sphere. And we asked them to code and annotate a lot of the pictures. For example, which language, which dialect, which medium, which function does the text have, where is the geolocation? So actually that can be too much for the citizens. And now I hand over to the last phase. Okay, thanks, Paula. Now we are right at the end of our citizen science project and it comes down to dissemination, our data. And um, as expected, here it is again, a, a mixture of two factors like time and communication. So if you have um, underestimated the uh, communication as a task, um, it can be a problem uh, if you involved your um, professional uh, communication department too late in the citizen science project, it can put up a, a rather high stress level. And um, the last point is um, if you provide too little information for the citizen scientists which are involved in the project, that um, is not a, a good point at all. And they may not come back to the project. So. Um, you see, there are a lot of points which can go wrong in citizen science projects. Um, but yeah, we leave it like this. But we want to know um, more about failures and um, kind of like um, if they happen to you and your citizen science project. And therefore, I hand over to Marika and we want to hear from you what happened in your project. Thank you very much to you, Barbara and Florian. So as Florian just said, we prepared another question for you, the last survey of today. Um, and we would like to know from you which of these fails that you just heard about happened in your citizen science project. So we prepared another Padlet and Florian will post the link um, to the Padlet in the chat, or you can again scan the QR code that you see here. And as you just saw now on the pictures, the uh, fails are um, categorized by project phase. So please, when you go through the fails, just check which ones um, of them happen to you and then like them or heart them as, uh, as you do in, uh, in Padlet. And there's also the possibility that if you don't find your fail, but you would like to add it, you can just click on the plus and do so. And in a moment, Marlene will share with us the palette, but maybe uh, let's keep it with the slide for one more moment. So the ones who want to scan the code can still do so. But I guess you already, if you were scanning before, you, you have your smartphone by your side and probably scanned it by now. So then let's change to the Padlet and then let's take a look what is happening here. 
So I will give you a bit more time because there is a lot to read and to see. And then we will check at the fails that were voted the most and see where uh, you have made uh, or the most of you had experienced uh, fails in citizen science projects. And please, if you would like, just add also your fails here. Or if you don't manage in time, you can, as I said before, come back and add them later because we would be really, really interested to know about what kind of fails you experienced in your projects. Or maybe also fails that you know about. Maybe it's, it was not your citizen science project, but you participated in one or uh, maybe you heard about fails that happened. That would be also very interesting to know. So I can see that especially in project planning, especially attracting participants is hard to do. And also time management um, and too high expectations of citizen scientists. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, time management is really crucial and uh, sometimes very hard to do with when there are especially many partners involved. So the ÖAD is um, coordinating the Sparkling Science Funding Program uh, where there are citizen science projects um, with schools. And um, we know that especially when it comes to schools, um, it is very complex to have a good time management there because of all the um, yeah vacation that schools have and the academic system just works so different than the school system. Florian was talking about it before. So yeah, time management is really, really crucial. Um, then if we check out data collection, we can see this that also hardware software is not always working well in the data analysis, um, well, there are not that many fails, but um, well, three participants said the data set uh, were too in, oh, oh God, what a word, in homogenous. I hope I pronounced it right. Maybe Paul can, <laughs> can correct me. Um, yeah. And then when we look uh, to this dissemination, uh, the most fails happened because communication was seen as an underrated or because communication was an underrated task and also um, there was too little time for project planning and for communicating the project and the communication design and actually if you look to the left because I missed the project idea many many people also said that they had issues with different ideas goals and motivations coming from different partners Yes, so thank you. Marika, very and much. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting yes, you. <laughs> there, there are some new failures. Ah, yeah, true. Yeah. Yes, I missed that. Sorry. They're rather good ones. So. Would you like to, to go on? <laughs> no, the one I like most is that the biggest failure is not to start a citizen science project in project planning <laughs> um, or uh, establishing support from other actors. That's um, a new part. The other new one is we expected more active engagement from citizen science participants. That's um, yeah, the expectations on the other side. And the dissemination um, part is the publishing house crashed. So anyhow, well. Ah, and there is one, one more that came at uh, in the project idea phase, yeah. top-down thinking. Um, yes, I think it is. Um, it, the, yeah. yeah. What do you want to say? So, if top-down thinking, I guess it's about when um, when it is when the citizen science project is set up by a scientific institution then there are a lot of expectations and already um, planned tasks and everything in the product design. And it doesn't allow for citizen scientists to really 
um, take part in designing the project and um, also adding their ideas and, and making contributions to the project, I mean, in another way than just collecting data maybe or analyzing data. Okay, I think that's it, Florian, Barbara, anything else that I missed or that, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for your participation. Um, it was really, really great uh, that you, um, yeah, let us know about how or what kind of fails you experienced. And now we will come to the next part of the webinar, which is, well, we experience a lot of fails maybe, or some fails. And we would also like to know actually, what can we do um, to prevent those fails? And uh, in this part, Malena and Thomas will sh share some anti-fail tips and talk about their experience from their projects. So I will share again the presentation and we will, yes, so, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marika. Um, I'm Thomas, I'm working at the Meteorological Institute in Austria. And uh, my background is having a citizen science project, which is running since 1851, which is pretty long and wasn't called citizen science at that time. But it's about collecting data of plants in different development uh, phases. And so we had a lot of experience um, how people collected data in former times. But well, we had to find out how to collect data in these times. and as the failures in citizen science project, the last questionnaire showed, um, much of that is about communication. Communication must be clearly and simply. And I think the question of about uh, tracking participants or uh, inaccurate addressing of participants is a, a question of how to communicate and um, might be a question of uh, failure in communication design. And we found out that uh, if you want people to do certain things, just be very specific, but in a few words. So if you tell them, collect data from trees who have yellow uh, leaf coloring, they, and you, well, you give them the opportunity to get a prize at the end of the day, they will really collect every single tree. But if you're not interested in every single tree, you have to be very specific which kind of tree you want to know. I want to have to uh, collect it or in certain areas to uh, look for those trees. Um, we had this uh, web app and uh, uh, smartphone application running for a um, few years and the first year was very um, successful. People uh, collected data and then winter time was coming, plants uh, disappeared and with the plants, citizen scientists disappeared. So what happened? Well, if you don't keep, keep in touch with them, um, they will, uh, well, they will, um, how to say, they forget you, they forget uh, the idea what they are on and just keep with them in touch and very important, um, have an integration, uh, in, integrate new um, participants in your team. So every citizen scientist must be considered as a part of your team. And if there's somebody new, say hello, welcome them. And uh, they will be uh, more included and they will be more open with you with uh, questions or if they have some uh, ideas about how to develop and um, well, make things better in your um, questions and in your uh, scientific research. And in this case, and be open for transdisciplinary cooperation. So uh, many citizen scientists attending in one topic have different backgrounds where they come from and they do have several questions which they come to you, um, with which they come to you and they want to be address them to somebody. So if you have questions which are not your field, well, be open to get some uh, other partners involved and well maybe do you have transdisciplinary corporations in that way 
uh, most important well it's about communication again it's the communication on high level so citizen scientists may not have your scientific educational background but they do have educational background at several other very important and interesting uh, things in life and they can tell you something or the the whole community so give them the chance to 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 share this and therefore we had um in our application a tool where you can share comments and you can comment on other people's um, data or pictures they send in so keep all the people together as a big family they can share and speak to each other this is very important so not everybody feels him or herself as a, a fighter on his own so but rather be a member of a family who are collecting and developing a great big uh, goal so make those people visible to each other and make yourself visible to all the others in the um, in the um, project so one you can do this on the website you can do this in application but may give them a chance especially in days like today where people have facebook accounts or instagram accounts and they want to share who they are and what they do so maybe there's a possibility to use this maybe not instagram and facebook but maybe in your um applications or maybe on personal meetings let's give them the possibility to be visible and well very important as i mentioned before if you have to restart every spring again it's not very helpful for the setting of your um project try to find long-term partners and build them up and once you have one keep them with you so not only the partners for uh, external or in institutional exchange but also those partners and citizen scientists in the app and together you can develop uh, new questions or you can um, aim for new other big partners to make the whole idea bigger these are just some ideas how you can avoid fails or how you can well not avoid but you can learn of your fails and turn them into success Marlene. Yes, thank you very much and um, welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is Marlene Ernst. I'm currently working at the Department for Digital Humanities at the University of Passau and hopefully can give some insight from a humanities point of view on anti-fail tips in the planning phase. So. Uh, as we all know, planning is a huge part of successful project realization and equally as well known is the fact that not always everything goes according to plan. The same is true for citizen science projects and as we are dealing with more or less large groups of people that may complicate things as well. We also have collected, uh, as I said before, anti tips for this part of uh, citizen science project management. And I will uh, talk today about some things that happened during um, a project on food history called Cooking Up Salzburg, uh, in which I was involved in during my time at the University of Salzburg. And um, you have on the slide all of our uh, anti-fail tips, and I will focus on some of them. So. For example, with estimating the needed human resources uh, realistically was part of our proposal uh, back then. Uh, so we made the plan that for transcribing and annotating early modern cookbook sources, in this instance, overall approximately 6,000 recipes, uh, we would need about 30 participants. Uh, we would need them to be uh, thoroughly um, uh briefed on how to deal with the sources and that took some time so we wanted a, a little bit of a smaller group to work with um, and we also split the workload into manageable working packages of approximately 10 pages each as the participation level exceeded the 
crowdsourcing stage and involved extracting additional information from early, early modern written sources, uh, the citizen scientists were extensively briefed, as I mentioned. And this briefing also included us telling them what their part in the project would not be about. So keep in mind to uh, make uh, the different roles clear and uh, so that the expectations of the um, citizen scientists as well as yours won't be disappointed. Uh, and, and raising false expectations is always uh, very difficult to deal with and always leads to grief in the end. So, um, and, and that's especially true, or, or so is my experience uh, with topics that almost everyone has an opinion about, like in this case, food and eating culture. Uh, the history of nutrition is a point of attraction for bro broad sections of so society, so we didn't have as many problems with um, attracting people to work with. Um, but uh, in this instance, we dealt with a Baroque culinary traditions and what that entails had to be made clear from the start. So uh, the initial group consisted of primarily right, uh, retirees who described themselves as non-digital natives. Uh, and so we also decided to split the training process in two parts. So first the actual transcription process was explained and what it means to transcri transcribe historical sources and that it really is important to consider every letter and symbol, even if the spelling according to modern standards is not correct. They also learned how to do research on unclear terms through contemporary sources. And only in the second part, uh, we uh, had them putting the recipes, including all the detailed researched information they are gathered uh, on the ingredients and other relevant elements into a research database. So it really helped to split those parts and, and um, uh, get them involved in the topic at first and only afterwards uh, deal with the digital part of the project. Nonetheless, the digital element was not the easiest part for many of the citizen scientists. Um, and there were some of them who couldn't or didn't want to deal with the database, the database part. And for this, we had to find an alter alternative solution. And it, in our case, it took the form of university students involved in the project who helped with the task and put the transcriptions of the citizen scientists, including the, their annotations, into the database. So um, we worked together and uh, people who didn't want to deal with the digital part didn't have to, um, and, and we had a workaround created this way. This approach of not excluding people and splitting the tasks also helped in establishing and keeping group dynamics intact and um, yeah, keep the uh, talking and creating of new ideas uh, very uh, in, a, in a productive way. The plan on the working packages of 10 pages was well and good and worked fine, at least on the paper. Um, but in reality, you have citizen scientists with different backgrounds and availabilities. And in the end, there were several people who did more than the fair share of the work and others who did less. In the end, work got done and even more than initially, initially planned. But you have to consider those availabilities when dealing with people who work with you in, in their often limited free time. To keep motivation up, giving out tasks in small batches also helped a lot and had the additional benefit of keeping in touch with the citizen scientists on a regular basis. So um, I was the contact person for them. And when they had questions, they came to me. And also when they were done with the working package and needed another one. And so we kept the um, contact ongoing and uh, in, in this process, but also had some special events to uh, mark uh, milestones, for example. The flexibility and availability on my part was one of the key elements. And my tip for you is do not panic if something doesn't go as planned. Few things in life ever do. 
but prepare some contingency, contingency plans and be prepared to adapt to change conditions. And yeah, well, with this final tip on my part, I would like to hand over to Johannes for the discussion part. Yes, thank you very much, Marlene. Uh, actually, my name is Johannes Rüdisser. I'm from the University of Innsbruck and I'm dealing with citizen science project in natural science. And I'm very happy to see that there is so a big interest. Uh, we are nearly 60 people uh, and there seems to be a very big interest in sharing, hearing about mistakes, which is very great. Nevertheless, as we saw from the survey before, oh, even in such a mystic keen groups, only 10% or less than 10% of the people would publish their mistakes. So I think it's a good, very good opportunity to share this. And I would like to share a definition of an expert I recently heard and I really liked in this context, which was that an expert is a person that has has or had the possibility to do nearly every mistake uh, that is possible to do in a very near field. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really good uh, definition of an expert of, or of a scientist. We have the chance to do a lot of errors and that makes us experts. So uh, as we are such a big group, uh, it's great that we have now uh, some 10 to 15 minutes left for discussion or for sharing some mistakes. And as I already saw that, there's a, the, that there were some people adding mistakes we didn't have on our lists, I just would ask you uh, if there is any I would say this very special failure you learned so much about and you think maybe other people didn't experience uh, in this group so far. So maybe there are some people that want to share their failure, just raise your hand and, and, and we will, we would address you to uh, talk about your failure. So think about failure in your projects and maybe you, you want to share this. Or if there is any, question regarding failures failures already happened for sure we are here for questions as well so i see claire hello um i think this is a really interesting topic thank you very much for running the session uh, i just wanted to share one of the feedbacks or well a failure that i thought was really interesting for us um when we we were working with schools in a project called seeds and when we initially approached the schools one of the challenges we had was that the researchers who had worked with these schools before had kind of burned bridges. So actually the schools didn't trust us anymore. And I think this is a failure that many people come up against because actually we, we maybe kind of finish our projects, our grant funding's over, goodbye. So it was just a really interesting failure to have to deal with because it meant we had to reestablish these relationships and try to directly address the fears and the, the concerns the schools had. So I, it wasn't a failure of our direct project, but it was a, a direct consequence of failures of previous projects. And I thought that was something that maybe we should talk about a lot more. Yes, thank you very much, Claire, for sharing this. Actually, that was a thing we were discussing in our group as well, because uh, that, that, that is a little bit related to our project-oriented financing we often have, because we often have project financing for two, three years, and then the project is over. And normally it takes you two to three years to establish good relationships with your partners. And then the project is over and you leave and you turn on to the next project and maybe you forget about your partner, which is really, really a pity in the citizen science context. If you do this with scientific partner, I would say they are more used to it and you may establish a new project, but with citizen scientists and with schools, this can really be a problem. So thank you very much for this uh, experience. Yes, I think many people dealing with schools or other social partner from the society deal with, uh, with similar things. Is there anybody else who wants to share a, uh, an experience 
or who has a question related to what we were talking about. Yes, Birgit, please. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for this great initiative. I just wanted to ask uh, maybe a very stupid question, uh, since I'm a beginner in citizen science projects. But what happens if you cannot address the appropriate number of citizen scientists outside of schools now? Or yes, thank, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for your question. I, I will start to answer and maybe some more uh, will drop in. Uh, as we saw from the, from the survey as well, this is something that happens to many people that they have difficulties to engage and gain their volunteers. And I think there is a lot of experience in different projects how you, how you can address. I think you have to, to separate how you address and then how you keep your volunteers. So addressing it is one thing. You have to do your public relation work, uh, get into journals, uh, always with a, with a good uh, focus on who is your target uh, people. So depending on, on, on the target person, if you really need people from a certain topic, you might address them differently than if you want to address general public. But then I think a very important thing is how to keep your volunteers and many project experience that you get the volunteers, they stay a little bit, but then they drop off. And I think uh, Thomas already mentioned, and there were some other uh, people mentioning this, it's very important to communicate back to your volunteers so that they feel integrated in your project. They must see how they contribute. Most of the people that contribute in citizen science project want to contribute something. Uh, this can be that they gather data or that they uh, follow a, a bigger purpose. But in order to feel them that they are contributing, uh, you have really to do a lot of communication work, uh, communicating back what is their part, what, what they contribute. And maybe some of my colleagues want to add something to this aspect, because I think that's a very, very crucial aspect in many citizen science projects. Marlene. Well, I uh, only mentioned it uh, on the on the offside, so to say, I um, with the cooking up Salzburg project, for example, we had in our proposal um, many, many plans on how to reach uh, the public and, and, and get our planned group of citizen scientists. And we were very lucky in the sense that uh, it we only had to use one of, I think, six different strategies we we had in, in, in the back uh, in order to get the initial group together. And, and that was a, an article, an interview we gave uh, in a, for a, a regional paper. So uh, it worked very well for our purposes. And I, in my experience, it, it really, depends on who you want to reach and 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 uh, what your project is about and and to um, get uh, into a, a medium uh, also in printed medium um, that uh, delivers to this uh, topic that is one thing i've seen working really really well for many projects so far and um yeah, so, but also have contingency, contingency plans for uh, times when this first plan doesn't work uh, and, and, and deliver posts to newsletters and uh, yeah, try everything to uh, going where your target group is and, and introducing yourself uh, personally. Uh, that also works really well, I have seen. Thank you very much, Marlene. There is a comment from Thomas and then Claire, please. 
So Birgit, if I got you right, you told us, or you asked the question that you don't find enough uh, participants at the first time. So you wanted to start something and there were not enough participants. Uh, that that's just a fear. Oh, that's just so a we fear. Have, we're okay. just at the beginning. But what if? What if? Well, it's <laughs> it's very good that you have this. Well, the question, the what if, in mind before you're at this point. Um, well, if there is no limitation in time, things will grow. So, well, as I told you, we have this network since 1851, and we had declining amount of participants. So. There are fewer and fewer from year to year, and we need to set up a new strategy to gain new participants. And well, the target group is very important, but who is your target group? And I think one of the easiest questions is who would be interested in the question you have? So are there people who have the same question? And if you're in, in natural sciences, for example, or nature loving people or people who have a garden might be interested in your topic. Or if you're in, in cooking books like Marlene did, well, you're completely wrong if you go out in the green. So find people who might have fun with that question or might have, same, have the same question. And these are um, the first target group. And from the very first people you meet, they can help you with new ideas where they where they think you could find new attendees in your citizen science project. So your idea is mo mo most, uh, well, I think it, it's not just for its own fun. You have a goal with your citizen science project and this goal will achieve new, um, new knowledge for certain people and those might be interested as well. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, I think Claire wants to add something to this as well. Sorry, I just, I will be very quick. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on things that Thomas and Marlene had said already, absolutely right in the context of recruitment. But I think going back to what Marlene said about contingency, I also think it's a very good idea to have like a concept of what great looks like, what okay looks like in terms of numbers and what, you know, maybe doing just enough looks like if you're doing, say, a big study where you need, you know, certain statistics to achieve your goals, uh, because I think sometimes you otherwise you have to go back and retrospectively start like matching your data and things like that, which is not OK. So I think maybe sometimes being a bit more realistic about up, like what amazing looks like and then kind of saying, OK, well, what happens if we don't hit amazing? What are the minimum numbers we need? that can be helpful in a sense of managing anxiety during recruitment phases. Thanks, Thank Tom. you very much. Thank you very much. There was another question in the chat and I will read it quickly to you. What is your opinion on the statement that co-design or co-produced citizen science projects have a lower risk of failing in achieving the goal of the project? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I Personally, think um, having a co-design in a project doesn't lower the chance to do failures. It's just a different approach and a different design. Um, I think even if you have a, a, a project design where you have a clear uh, setup where your volunteers collect data or analyze data in, in very limited area, uh, you can fail in achieving the goals and even in a co-design project, you can fail to meet uh, the goals of your project. So I think it's just different approaches. And I think both of them have their area where it's useful to, to have them. Um, I see another question and I think I get this next question from Nick Nicholas. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I analyze citizen science uh, projects from the aspect of multi-stakeholder uh, settings. And so different ideas and goals and motivations are not a problem per se, but the lack of exchange at the beginning about, or the knowledge about the other organizations and, and their 
logics and, and, and needs. Um, and uh, we developed here uh, in Germany a project with the Stifterverband. Um, it's called Trust Map, um, where we use design thinking uh, and uh, project simulation to actually uh, think about uh, what are the um, incentives that could actually make other um, actors move and also what could be events that could actually happen in such a project. And um, here in, in Potsdam, we also did a, a survey and I think it's also a, a really nice incentive what we did. It's, um, we, um, we had a, a organization of alumni um, that said, okay, we will, for every uh, participation, we will give one euro to a sustainable student project. So it's actually an indirect uh, incentive. Uh, and I think it's, it's useful to work with foundations and to work with uh, civil society associations that one has the money to actually give also some incentives, but there can be indirect incentives for the project. And the, the project is about transfer and impact and less about publication. So um, it's more a transfer project. So you actually want to have to look more at the uh, output outcome and impact. Um, and it could be that you need to have um, to think incrementally and to have higher incentives maybe at the end of the project. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for this uh, important and interesting comment. As our time is, uh, is finishing, running out, I would uh, just add a, a final comment before handing over back to Marika. Um, uh, I, I was really impressed, as I said at the beginning, of the high number of interest in this kind of webinar. And I think it's really fruitful, even if it's a short time, to exchange this kind of experience. And I invite everybody to uh, think about additional and further formats we could uh, use and implement to share our uh, failure, failures and mistakes. So uh, maybe a broad invitation uh, to get into contact with us uh, to organize further such kind of events or maybe really thinking about this special issue in a bigger group. Uh, thank you very much. And I hand over to Marika who has the final words, I guess. Yes, very big words for the final. <laughs> thanks, Johannes. Uh, thanks for leading uh, the discussion. Um, that is a very nice um, idea to actually for participants to get back to us with ideas how we could organize or what kind of other events we could do in order to open up the conversation uh, on fails. And I will um, just share for one more second my screen with the wrong slide, of course, um, because, because, because I just want to, well, finish. And I finish by saying thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you to my colleagues of whom we organized this webinar. And thank you also for uh, to EXA that we could do it actually uh, in this format. Um, we're really, really happy how everything went. I hope it was as interesting um, to you as it was uh, to us. And please, yeah, remember what Johannes said at the end. We will be really interested to hear more from you and a last um, tip from me um, just to finish this whole webinar uh, from our side so if you ever fight with smart art in uh, powerpoint just get some professionals like exa <laughs> to help you <laughs> and make a nice graphics like this one so thanks again and um yeah just um, get uh, in touch with us. Um, here's the email address that you can use for writing to us. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And I will hand over back to Paul.
Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thanks for the exo plug, by the way. Bye bye. We're always glad to hear that we're appreciated. Um, I'd just like to wrap this up by thanking all the speakers for sharing their invaluable time and insight with us. And I'd like to thank all the participants as well for taking the time out of their day to join us. Um, just one quick announcement. This will be the last EXA webinar of the year, um, but we do plan on having a whole slew of webinars next year. So please check our, um, our, social media channels on a regular basis. And if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, you can do that as well from our website, uh, exa.ngo. And if any of the speakers have any final thoughts or anything they'd like to share, projects, social media handles, anything like that. I will share our uh, address again also, uh, in case someone wants to get in touch. Yeah, with maybe if you could you know, put the website here I mean, I guess it's here now and placed. And you know, thanks. And I guess this is a great, great network. I mean, to advance an important thing. And I guess hopefully it will grow and uh, have a lot of uh, branches to new, new areas of of science. And I think that it's the future anyway. <laughs> Based on the, you're gonna all we do lots of this digital kind of platforms and developments so on and wearables. So I, I think this is something that we we I mean like to expand in in terms of the. Uh, getting more branches and capabilities to monitor people in a good way and fun way also actually and bio gaming and stuff like that but thanks well, thank you um then i would like to thank everybody again for coming out and hope everybody has a nice evening thanks for joining us yeah thank you too. Bye. bye thanks thank you for having us of course. thank you